Hi, I'm David Bettino. Hi, I'm Hazuki Kataoka Bettino. And together we've, uh, since 2003, we've been writing and performing and publishing uh, Kamishibai. And uh, today we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we've learned and give you some tips and ideas for making and performing your own. So our series is called Story Card Theater. And do you remember what first inspired you to look into the format? Yes. Um... Uh, one day, um, when our older son was like uh, in the preschool, uh, I went to his classroom and I saw his teacher um, showing the book. It was a story time, and so she put out um, a book like this, and then she st started playing the cassette tape recorder. So at that time, um, I was uh, kind of uh, disappointed that she didn't tell the story um, with her own voice. So I thought, well, why doesn't she do that? And then later, um, I realized that uh, she wanted to show the pictures um, and then she didn't want to uh, read and show and turn the page and read you know it's very difficult uh, for kids to focus and even for the teachers so so I think that that's the uh, main reason and then I thought that um, why doesn't she use kamishibai mm -hmm. you know I grew up in Japan and I played with kamishibai when I was uh, growing up so I thought it was like a common thing then um, I realized that uh, in the States, uh, we didn't have kamishibai uh, at that time. It, well, at least it wasn't that popular. So um, I came home and then um, I talked to David, like, you know, uh, we don't have it in this, uh, you know, we, we don't have this wonderful traditional Japanese folk um, storytelling format. Why don't we start publishing? our own stories and because you know he was a uh, magazine editor and uh, he has a background um, for writing but you know he said no <laughs> <laughs> he said it's too much trouble right I don't remember that part of it but uh, what I do <laughs> I, <was rejected. laughs> I do remember it was uh, a couple years later when our son was in first grade uh, he was in a parent participation school, so we were called in several hours per week to uh, help out in the classroom. And one of the things the teacher asked me to do was to read stories to the kid. So suddenly I was in that same position that the preschool teacher was, and I had books to read to them. And I would have to, you know, turn my head and talk out of the side of my neck, and it was just a really unpleasant way to share stories. And I would come home with a sore throat from yelling and a stiff neck. And um, we just both thought there had to be a better way. So we dove in and uh, started, uh, uh, we wrote a story and we had a, a fortunate encounter at that point with a friend of ours who's an artist. Do you remember? Yes. Um... His name is Mario Uribe. Uh, he is Mexican-American, but uh, he had a, a long uh, history with Japanese art and then also um, uh, working as an illustrator and graphic designer. So we went to talk to Mario and then he said that, wow, I, I've never heard of Kamishibai, but that's a great idea and then also I have already started uh, drawing my favorite story, The Peach Boy, uh, Momotaro the Peach Boy. So it's a great coincidence, and uh, that sort of informed the whole way the, the business took off. We started partnering with different illustrators, and then we used a uh, profit sharing agreement. So after a book would start selling, we would then split the, uh, the proceeds, and that made it a really affordable way to go out and, and self publish. Um, so that was Momotaro, and mm -hmm. we had a lot of fun with that. Started um, 
performing locally in libraries and schools and bookstores. And we liked it so much that we thought, well, maybe we should try another story in this format, um, but with a story that American audiences uh, would be more familiar with. And that was... The Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk. So one thing uh, Hazuki did was she read a lot of um, different versions of the story and uh, we uh, sort of retold it in a way that had a more uplifting moral to it than the tradition, one of the traditional storylines mm. where Jack is sort of a sneaky thief. Um, in this, this version that we found, uh, he's more rescuing the, uh, the treasures that the giant stole from his family. So um, we, we try to put some good values into our stories. Um, that was also sort of a, a reaction to the work that you'd been doing at the time. Mm -hmm. You were working at a video game company. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I was um, in the video game industry, which was filled with uh, violence and, and also gruesomeness. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want my kids to get um, kind of grow up with those things. And instead, I really um, uh, wanted to give them something wholesome and fun and uh, safe. Um, and then uh, I thought the Kamishiba is a great thing for them. Yeah, so at, at that point we had two boy stories. And so we thought we would uh, try one from a uh, girl's perspective as well. But again, we took a slightly different approach. And what was this one? This is the uh, Kaguya Hime, the Moon Princess. This is a... Uh, um, a thousand year old, uh, one of the, the oldest uh, literature from Japan uh, about the uh, princess from the moon. And she's not the typical princess um, waiting for the Prince Charming. She's independent. Uh, she doesn't belong to a man. Or... So um, we really like that. Um, I think it's kind of modern and then I think um, it's a good moral for uh, girls and the boys too. <laughs> yes, we had a lot of fun with that. And one interesting thing on the artwork side is both uh, Jack and the Beanstalk and Kaguya Hime were illustrated by the same person, Kazumi Verkler. And you can see her um, art style evolved from the, the first one to the second one, where it's very uh, clear and simple illustrations in Jack. And then in the, the second one, she started um, illustrating the, the colors on the computer and uh, uh, used authentic uh, kimono patterns as the, um, the background. So it, it added another level of, of texture. And this story is more literary. It's, it's really the most um, uh, literary of, of all our stories. Um, there is you know, foreshadowing and symbolism and there's a, a lot of text. Um, so it's a, a different type of uh, kamishibai style. Uh, and then in contrast, uh, the next one, um, another friend of ours came along who is uh, also an illustrator in a, a different style. Uh, this is Nina Hashchina. She's uh, Russian and wanted to tell a Russian folktale in the format. And so she had a bunch of um, art ready and then we worked together and designed some more and then she had a, a very rough sketch of the story and uh, we divided that up into the different scenes and uh, sort of cliffhangers of Kamishibai. And uh, so that was a really fun collaboration. And this one, um, very, very sparse on the, the language. It's designed more as an interactive story, or a guessing game for, for kids who are as, as young as two years mm -hmm. old. Um, so kind of a, we've done quite a range of, of stories so far, just in these four. And then we've also, for quite a while, been working on a fifth story. And this one's a real family production. Our son, who kicked off the whole enterprise here, uh, actually did the illustrations for that. And so that will be our first um, original story and completely produced in-house, as mm -hmm. it were. Hopefully someday we'll print and <laughs> publish them. <laughs> right. So 
wanted to talk a little bit about the design of a story card. Um, on the front, of course, we have the, uh, the artwork that the audience is seeing. The back side is the, uh, the text. Uh, all of our cards are bilingual. Um, our newest story is trilingual. That's the one that's still in development. And we include a little table of pronunciation and for the uh, foreign words. And in Kamijibai style, at the, uh, the top of the card, there's a thumbnail image of what the audience is seeing so that you know you're matched up. There's also a, a title of the card so you know what the scene is. And when you switch it around, everything always stays matched up. And um, that's actually one of the interesting challenges when you're producing your own Kamishibai, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, getting the text to match up with the picture. And when we took our cards in for printing, we actually had a funny moment when the, uh, the printer, the commercial printer said, hey, we fixed everything for you. Now the text and the uh, artwork are on the same card. And we were like, no, <laughs> that'll be all messed up. So uh, on our uh, website, we have a chart that shows exactly how you can arrange the, uh, the art and the text. Um, we'll also show you another technique in a moment that's good for um, classrooms that, that makes it a bit easier. Oh, by the way, we've got our, our own stage here, our butai in Japanese. Um, having a stage or a frame for your cards is uh, just a wonderful way to give your hands more freedom. You can, uh, you know, make sound effects or play musical instruments or just get much more expressive. So um, we uh, designed our, our own frame here there's a little fold out foot and there's a, a channel for the cards to go into. Um, so it's a lot simpler and more compact than the uh, traditional ones. Um, and we don't make these anymore. They prove to be pretty expensive to make. It looks simple, but... Um, simple design, but yeah. it takes some precision. So we, uh, I'll put some uh, information up on our, our website, storycardtheater.com about uh, how you can make your own if you're feeling adventurous. <laughs> a lot of people just make them out of cardboard, but again, just any way that you can uh, position your cards so that you have your hands free to uh, to talk and play instruments and do other interactive things uh, just makes the performance much nicer. Yeah, but, um... oh, yeah this is a fun one. Um, this is one uh, called a thunder tube. It makes a really amazing sound of thunder and uh, storm. And always when we perform with this, you know, kids come, um, come to touch it and play with it. You know, they love it. <laughs> In this segment, we wanted to talk about how you can make your own kamishibai. And um, we were really fortunate when we were uh, visiting uh, schools that uh, some of the classes, after seeing our presentations, would start uh, uh, developing their own. And we got this wonderful set of uh, stories from some middle schoolers at Cupertino Middle School in California. And you can see these are printed their uh, construction paper. And on the, uh, the front of the card, the students have uh, taped or glued or stapled uh, their original artwork. And on the back, they've uh, glued their text. And uh, it becomes a, just a brilliant project for schools because you learn so many different skills while you're working on this. You, um, the class can play to its strength. So there may be one kid in a group who feels very comfortable drawing and another feels good writing and someone has ideas but can't really actualize them. And so the, all the kids can get together and uh, collaborate on these uh, projects. And then the thing that makes it wonderful is the end presentation or the end, of, the end result is a presentation that they can share with each other. So they, uh, we noticed 
that even later on in the school year, kids, after learning the Kamishibai technique, would use it for other types of school reports they would have to make to their class. It's sort of a, um, a paper version of PowerPoint in a way, but just much more friendly with the audience because you're, you're constantly looking out in the eyes. Um, oh, and the other thing I was going to mention is, uh, since I'm an editor, um, one of the things I like to do is to read my text aloud to make sure there are no difficult parts, um, no awkward wordings. And when uh, kids are writing, you'll often find they'll dash off some project and then just to be done with it, they won't go back and revise or edit. Uh, just, um, but when you have to get up and present your story to a class, then you have the kind of inspiration and, and the real Mm -hmm. benefit of, of doing this sort of iterative editing. So um, one thing that we did when we were developing our stories was we do exactly the same thing. We would um, sketch out some artwork and then we would uh, tape some text on the back and then we would take them into schools and we would perform them. And while one, one of us was performing, the other would watch the audience and um, kind of monitor what parts, where do they lose focus? What parts did they really react to? And like, what were some difficult words to pronounce or awkward phrasings? And by doing that sort of uh, refinement, it's it's almost like a, a musician uh, touring with a new song. You can find out what the audience likes and then you can you know change it up a little bit and improve it. So that becomes just a wonderful exercise for, for school kids as they they can see that it, it really is valuable to make uh, changes to a story and edit it and polish it. Also with Kamishibai, um, like a storytelling in front of the audience or you know, your classmates um, like without, um, you know, just by yourself, it's mm. a little intimidating, but mm. with the, the story card, you know, cars or photos um, and telling stories. And if you're shy, you can just hide. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's, um, it's a really um, kind of less intimidating and a fun way to present uh, your project. So I saw um, a lot of kids were really enthusiastic, even shy ones. Mm, they would kind of come out and mm -hmm. they're very proud of, of their work. Mm -hmm. In this um, section, we wanted to talk a bit about some of the uh, design tips. Um, uh, one of the, in terms of the artwork, um, one of the things to remember is that you're often presenting kamishibai at a significant dif distance. People will be seated all the way across the room or in a, a bigger stage setting. Um, so making the artwork uh, as simple and clear as as possible really mm -hmm. helps. It's 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 good to have some some kind of hidden treasures for the the kids to pick out, and often they'll come up later and and look and try to see the the details. Um, but just make sure that when you're picking a moment to illustrate in the story, um, or cutting out a, a photo from a magazine or, or printing something from from the internet. Um, just focus on something that's clear and, and distinctive and readable from across the room. Text-wise, um, we, um, we made a, um, a mistake <laughs> at first. Um, we um, published Peach Boy uh, for the very first time. And then at that time, um, since he's from the um, writing background, um, we put a lot of text uh, in one card. Yeah, so I was, right? I was writing technical articles for an adult audience, so uh, my writing style was not really designed for speaking or performing in a way. So the, the first edition of Momotaro, uh, we actually sold out of that and then completely redid it for the second one, um, did have a lot of awkward phrasing and one thing in particular was um, we realized that because in Kamishibai the picture is always in view you don't really have to describe the picture um, the way you would with uh, text so they, the text and the picture can be much more complementary mm -hmm. so you don't have to say he's wearing a red cap or, or whatever um, 
you can just get right to the action. Some of the other things uh, we learned from uh, other Kamishibai stories were that uh, dialogue is, is wonderful. Um, it gives you a chance to act out a little bit, um, add, add some spice to the story. Um, short, punchy words, mm -hmm. uh, short sentences. Um, uh, sensory words are fun. We have a, a line in Momotaro that, that always gets the kids uh, excited or always gets them to laugh when the yogurt falls to the ground like a stinky wet sock. So talking about, you know, smell and things you would smell or hear or feel or, you know, touch um, just makes the, the story resonate a lot more. One of the hallmarks of Kamishibai is the drama as you're turning the page. So each, we like to think when we're designing a story of each card is sort of a scene in a movie. Um, and in movies, uh, as in Kamishibai, the transition is really the joy of the performance. So uh, Moon Princess is a great example here. Um, sometimes you'll want to change the card slowly to sort of tease the audience, and that's sort of like a dissolve in cinema. And sometimes um, you'll want to move it really quickly, like a cut, and when there's a sudden surprise. Like so that. in this one, yeah. explain what's going on okay, here. Okay, so the old man found um, something uh, in the bamboo, the uh, bright shining bamboo, and he found we he found the gold like this kind of slowly and then like so the moment of sliding the card is the time of the um, concentration uh, of the audience so we use it uh, very often in our performance and then for, um, and then the next card is like a, the moon princess grows really fast she grew into a young lady in three months, like this. Hmm. So the card is traditionally drawn from left to right, and so we designed the artwork to uh, kind of evolve from left to right as well as it's being unveiled. Um, and in contrast, uh, an example of a cut would be in uh, Momotaro when the peach opens up and there's a little baby inside, so that's a wonderful surprise mm -hmm. and uh, so you would kind of tease the audience and say what do you think is inside this big peach and then you get a bunch of question a bunch of answers and then all of a sudden you can whip out the card and <laughs> it's a big a big surprise uh, i'd like to tell you that there are two schools of kamishibai performance one is um kyoiku style the kyoiku is uh, educational style, which is recommended by International Kamishibai Association of Japan, uh, I Ikaja. Um, so they, they um, and then also like the other one is a, a street performance style. Uh, it's called the Gaito Kamishibai style, which um, does more, you know, um, the performers do more performance making music and uh, sound effects and um, the gestures so yeah, character um, voices uh-huh and then kyoiku kamishibai uh, education kamishibai style um, they recommend that uh, the performer to be a kind of step back a little bit uh, you still you know be interactive with, with the audience but make the uh, kamishibai uh, pictures the main character, not the performer. Mm. So I do uh, mostly the kyoiku style uh, performance, and David does um, gaito style. The Cat with No Name, written and illustrated by Nina Hashina. I knew an old couple once, an old man and woman, they had a kitten. Black were her ears, and white were her cheeks. Black were her sides, and white was her belly. But one thing was missing.
She didn't have a name. One day, the old man said, Our kitten is getting bigger. We give her food and milk, and we play with her. We should give her a name, too. What do you think a good name would be? Remember, this is a Russian cat, so it needs a Russian name. Well, the old woman said, Our kitten will be tall and strong. We should call her Jedeva. Jedeva. What, what, what does Jedeva mean? Tree. But the old man said, No, our cat will be taller than any tree. Bigger than any building. She'll be so big, she'll fill the sky. We should call our kitten Oblaka. Oblaka. Cloud. No, said the old woman after some thinking. A cloud is lighter than a pillow. I know something that blows it back and forth, then brags a victory in a howling voice. We should call our kitten Vater. Wind. No, my dear, said the old man. The wind does move clouds, but one thing will stand strong. We should call our kitten Stina. Wall. To that, the old woman replied, My husband, you are old. and Your hearing is failing you. Don't you hear the squeaking in the corner? Something is making a hole in the wall. A wall is not the strongest thing. We should call our kitten Mushka. What squeaks in the corner and makes a hole in the wall? Mouse. No, my dear, the old man smiled. A mouse is strong, but I know something stronger. We should call our kitten Koshka. Cat. The cat opened one eye, said meow, which is meow in Russian, and went back to sleep. The end. We always tell people to really do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, the audience is focused on the artwork, and uh, so if you feel inspired to, you know, pick up a musical instrument and add something, or wave your hands, or do a character voice, then go for it, and the audience will um, probably join in. Um, they always join in when we do it, and it's it's just a wonderful interaction. Um, on the other hand, if you want to maintain more of a mood and a, a calm, thoughtful storytelling. Or like in the classroom situation. Classroom, right, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily be uh, mm -hmm. singing and dancing, jumping on one leg. Um, then just uh, take it slow and uh, do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Just have fun. Have, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's why we got into it and, and why we're still doing it. And uh, we hope that you'll take some of these ideas and uh, write your own kamishibai and share them with uh, the people all around you. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to thank um, everyone at the uh, World Kamishibai group and especially Walter and Tara and Donna for inviting us to participate. And uh, we had a great time sharing some of uh, the things we've discovered uh, since we started in 2003. And um, uh, there's a lot more on our website, storycardtheater.com. You can uh, find performance tips and uh, downloadable sheet music and uh, pronunciations of the uh, some of the Japanese words that are in, in the stories. Um, we've also run a uh, Facebook group called the World of Kamishibai, uh, which is designed to let people share their own 
uh, techniques and stories and ask questions of each other. And uh, it really took off. I, we I had no idea when it started how worldly it really would become. I think uh, probably English is the, the least used language there now. <laughs> There's uh, people from just all over the world. And it's just really fascinating to see how, how much Kamishibai has, has touched um, the whole globe. Mm -hmm. So thanks again. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you.